Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Khaitan's webinar dealing with pre-transaction issues in public M&A. This webinar is very topical because of the unique issues involved in public M&A transactions. I would like to welcome Mr. Mohan Lada, our corporate partner, who specializes in public M&A and regulatory matters. Mohan. Thank you, everyone, for joining this webinar. <coughs> Um, we'll start with a quick agenda where I'll tell you what exactly uh, is going to be covered in the webinar today. What we've tried to do is that we've thought of it as a series. So this is the one which we are going to do for the pre-transaction issues, which are specifically relevant in a public m &A transaction. Uh, and thereafter, we will follow it with uh, sessions which will deal with issues relevant during the transaction and thereafter. With the agenda, the first aspect that we are going to deal with is the specific aspects one needs to understand and be uh, prepared for while initiating a public m and transaction. This is because there are timelines, trigger thresholds, etc. prescribed and rules under the SEBI insider trading regulations which prescribe information sharing and other aspects. So we will deal with what are the uh, what are the aspects you need to be careful of under the insider trading regulations. What are the steps that are relevant in case your transaction is likely to trigger the requirement for a mandatory tender offer? A certain issues which we think were interesting from a foreign investment regulation perspective, uh, including the pricing guidelines. So we'll begin with the uh, a quick introduction of the life of a public M&A transaction. Like in all usual transactions, you first have a target that is identified. Because it is a public listed target, you are able to access a lot of information available in the public domain or filings that have been made with the stock exchanges, which lets you get uh, basic information of financials, any corporate actions, etc. Thereafter, you move to the next stage where you would like to get access to the data room and commence a due diligence. A precursor to that is that you enter into a confidentiality arrangement and initiate certain corporate processes, which we will discuss as we go forward uh, in the next slide, next few slides. That also involves sharing of sensitive information, uh, which is information that is material and likely to impact the price of the shares. And you then move to actually having a definitive agreement, uh, which deals with your governance right uh, regarding your investment in the company. We now move to insider trading regulations and the important considerations that one needs to be mindful of dealing with information related to listed companies. Before we sort of progress, I think we can spend a little time on the key concepts. The basis really of having the regulation in place is to ensure that there is a clear and similar symmetry of information so far as a public shareholder or any other shareholder is concerned who happens to have access to additional information. So the first concept is who becomes an insider. While we would usually imagine that a person who is part of the management, part of the board, or in some manner involved with the company would be an insider, yes, that is true. That would be a connected person. The scope of the Indian regulations is even wider. So anybody who gets access to any unpublished price sensitive information such person qualifies as an insider. Obviously, connected persons are insiders as well, and people can be connected by virtue of employment, by virtue of an advisory role, or any connection with the company which entitles and entails sharing of unpublished price sensitive information, which is information of such nature that it is likely to impact the price of the securities of the company. So it would be information like financial results, information regarding any new corporate action, 
a possible declaration of dividend. So it's something that's likely to impact the price of the securities and is not generally available in the public domain. And when I say generally available, it's very, very categoric. What would amount to being generally available? So if information is available on the stock exchange announcement section or the company's website, it would amount to being generally available. But information otherwise that sometimes is shared with media or maybe a year say or a conversation shared with a small group of people would not qualify as a information that is generally available because it needs to be available to the public at large. Moving on to the next slide, while there is, there are certain set of prohibitions under the SEBI insider trading regulations. There are also carve outs that have been provided for uh, situations that are requiring such sharing of information. So there is a concept of legitimate purpose and you are allowed, while you're usually not allowed to share unpublished price sensitive information, the only time you're allowed to share this is if it is for a legitimate purpose or as part of performance of duty, the relevant individual needs to have access to this information. Plus, you can share this information if it's required by law. So if a regulation requires a certain disclosure to be made to a government authority or statutory authority, yes, you will be able to, that would be a carve out as well. And lastly, what is more relevant to us is if you are initiating a due diligence as part of a potential transaction and there is a specific process prescribed for how this information is shared uh, which we will discuss in the subsequent uh, slides but just to discuss a little more about what amounts to legitimate purpose was not very clear until recently where certain amendments were carried out after, as per the recommendation of the SEBI fair market conduct committee what the company is now required to do is that basis the business that they have and the basis the special needs that they would have they will determine and have a proper legitimate purpose policy a policy which helps you determine what would amount to a legitimate purpose in that entity's case and this will be included as part of their uh, code of conduct for fair disclosure uh, second is in case you are hiring a law firm or a consultant for certain advisory and you need to share certain information or if you need to share information with your internal strategy teams m a teams or other functionaries of the organization there you're allowed to share information to the extent needed for performance of such duties now moving on to how does the indian insider trading regulations permit sharing of information in case of a due diligence that is proposed to be undertaken. In case there is a potential transaction, which there are two scenarios to discuss. One is when there is a potential transaction where there would possibly be an open offer or a mandatory tender offer that will be triggered. Uh, what I mean by that is that in case the acquisition or the potential transaction involves acquisition of shares beyond a certain threshold, or acquisition of control there would be a mandatory tender offer to be made to the public shareholders if a transaction does involve it then uh, you are allowed to share this information if the board of directors of the company passes a resolution and approves such sharing if they believe that such sharing of information is in interest of the target company uh, there is no separate requirement for thereafter sharing this information because in case of a mandatory tender offer, you would have offer documents in place and your offer documents would have the relevant disclosures and sufficient information will be available before the transaction, you know, is entered into and, you know, concluded really. Then the second type of transaction is a transaction where you do not trigger the requirement for a mandatory tender offer. So this would be a transaction where you're not crossing the thresholds or you're uh, having an exempted transaction. In such cases, the board still needs to approve such sharing of information and still needs to be of the view that such sharing will be beneficial for the target company. Uh, but before any agreement is entered into for this transaction, 
at least two trading days before that the unpublished price sensitive information will have to be made available generally now what would that be and how would that be available is an interesting uh, topic really because you may have had access to a large set of documents in the data room but the findings that you have which are material and that could have an impact would constitute an unpublished price sensitive information also there is no prescribed procedure for sharing this information but ideally uh, because it has to be generally available it would be on the stock exchange announcement section uh, which will then disseminate to all uh, on the platform so available to all public shareholders and it can additionally also be available on the company's website uh, sorry before i proceed i want to just add that please feel free to keep sending in your questions on the portal uh, we will be taking the questions right after our session concludes and even if there are additional questions we will be responding to them over email uh, i then move to the next topic which is trading which is also a a very relevant topic because under the insider trading regulation the there are there is a threefold restriction first restriction is on communication of unpublished price sensitive information so we've dealt with a situation how you could communicate without being in violation the second one is causing communication so that as well as dealt with if you are covered by one of those legitimate purposes and one of the examples we discussed and the due process is followed that's fine and the third one is you cannot trade when in possession of unpublished price sensitive information and you cannot trade during certain periods trading has been very very widely defined under the regulations it includes it's an inclusive definition and it includes subscribing buying selling dealing and agreeing to subscribe as well uh, so any sort of action so far as your securities is concerned will constitute as trading um, and uh, now i already dealt with how information will become generally available so unless and until information continues to be unpublished and price sensitive you cannot trade uh, when you are in possession of such information you can always trade once it becomes generally available and we did discuss in the previous slide that if you have received this information as part of a due diligence then you will wait for two trading days even before entering into an agreement for this transaction which is because the word trading includes agreeing to subscribe as well or agreeing to acquire as well now the next one is the blackout period and implications under this period now this i will briefly touch upon this topic i thought it's relevant because we've seen a recent uh, transaction where this question did come up so quickly to summarize a blackout period or a window closure period as we call it under the code of conduct is a period where no trading is permitted and this is sort of an action taken by the compliance officer of the company to prevent any uh, trades being uh, executed or any pre approval request being received for such trades during this period because during that period there is a likelihood that company officials and certain members would have access to unpublished price sensitive information so it could be a time when just before the board is going to approve financials uh, plus there could be situations where you are uh, you know having access to certain information which otherwise will have an impact on the price now a life of a general transaction starts off with an initial pre approval assuming a one of the person who is party to the transactions requires to obtain a pre approval they would obtain the approval and they would start the transaction a usual transaction if it involves an open offer uh, it could take around maybe around approximately 60 days and there could be a situation where you have obtained an approval and the window was not closed when you entered into the agreement all the information thereafter became publicly available but when you did plan to do your completion or closing of your transaction after all conditions were met you happen to be in a period which is a window closure period now in such situations one could always argue and one needs to evaluate the situation in entirety but if there is no other unpublished price sensitive information and only information is relating to the transaction and everything that has been duly received and sort of disseminated then one could argue or take a position that 
the window closure or the blackout period may not be applicable because this is a transaction where trade per se has been initiated already when the agreement was entered into and this is only certain procedural aspect which is required to be now completed so i think that brings me to the end of the so you know sort of broad concerns and relevant issues that you need to be mindful of from an insider trading perspective prior to commencing uh, an mna transaction we now move to the sebi takeover regulations which prescribe the requirement for a mandatory tender offer depending on certain thresholds and if you are otherwise acquiring control i want to specially emphasize that this is a very very relevant uh, topic even in cases where there is a global transaction involving an in india leg because we've seen many situations where india leg happens to be a small uh, investment in the larger scheme of things but given the percentage of shareholding and also the likelihood of control or existing control you potentially end up triggering the requirement for an open offer in india so we will uh, go ahead and discuss that but this is also very very relevant in such transactions now before we get into more detail uh, i want to very briefly discuss a few key concepts which are very interesting uh, one is the acquirer obviously so anybody who's acquiring or agreeing to acquire uh, you know sort of shares or voting rights beyond the prescribed thresholds or acquire control will constitute as an acquirer uh, it also will include persons acting in concert with him when they are calculating the threshold and what i mean by saying persons acting in concert is people or entities which are acting jointly with the acquirer and have a common objective and common approach of acquiring substantial shareholding or control in the listed company so if there were two groups who were acquiring a certain percentage we will aggregate it if they are you know sort of having the common objective to jointly control then we go to the definition of acquisition which is interesting again because it also includes any agreement to acquire so you may have entered into an agreement you may have not actually yet acquired but there could be requirements that are triggered so even a global agreement once you have entered into the global agreement and made your press release you've already triggered the requirement of a offer in india a little bit more time we spend on who becomes a person acting in concert plus i want to mention that persons acting in concert while one is a situation where two unrelated parties come together but they have a common objective and they have meeting of minds such that we will acquire a substantial rights uh, or which is beyond the threshold and control and this could be pursuant to a written agreement or an oral agreement the other situation is certain persons by virtue of their relationship are considered and deemed to be acting in concert with each other unless you can prove to the contrary for example a holding company and a subsidiary company would be considered as a uh, deemed person acting in concert Uh, an immediate relative with another relative would be deemed to be acting in concert a uh, directors along with the company promoters and other members of the promoter group so it's very very tricky here sometimes when you have two groups in the promoter groups and both of them are independently having their own objectives but they happen to be part of the promoter groups and therefore they will be deemed to be person acting in concert what you will then do if you do think that you are having this relationship but you don't seem to be having a common objective and you don't want the existing shareholding of the other party to be aggregated you need to prove to the contrary but the onus is on the party uh, and sebi will have a right to question this the reason why we emphasize the concept of person acting in concert is because firstly for calculation of limits your shareholding gets aggregated secondly for determining control you will be aggregated and therefore your disclosure suppose one of your deemed person acting in concert was to acquire control you will start getting disclosed as a promoter group uh, going forward 
and your documentation for the offer discloses information of the acquirer and the person acting in concert at par plus it creates a joint and several liability on both the acquirer and PAC for all open offer related obligations. Now, what are these triggers and what are these obligations one needs to be mindful of? First is in a direct acquisition, if you're getting the ability to exercise 25% or more voting rights, that's the first level of trigger. If you're already someone who holds 25% along with your other persons acting in concert and you are crossing the 5% threshold, then you are, uh, then you will trigger an offer as well. The third category is irrespective of the shareholding. If you are acquiring control in the company by virtue of a voting agreement, by virtue of having board positions, by virtue of controlling the board of directors, it would all, all lead to a trigger of an open offer. And the last one is indirect acquisition, which particularly we've seen instances in global acquisitions where an entity maybe is acquired in an overseas offshore jurisdiction and it does have multiple layers, but it happens to somewhere have an Indian listed company where it is disclosed as a promoter or promoter group or has shareholding beyond the 25% threshold. In such cases, what really ends up happening is that you end up triggering the requirement for an offer and this requirement really is sort of requires you to make an make a public announcement very quickly within four working days you can delay your uh, you can delay the the actual uh, you can delay the actual detailed public statement uh, and you can make that uh, detailed public statement after you've completed the primary acquisition but your initial in announcement is very very relevant and it has to be made immediately now going also there could be a situation where you may not acquire indirectly or directly a shareholding beyond the prescribed thresholds but you end up having control or end up acquiring control and this has been a matter of debate for a long time there have been multiple judgments and orders where this issue has been dealt with uh, we first take the definition and then i tell you what uh, could be the position and what are the potential rights which could entitle you to control and what are the protective rights which should not ideally be treated as giving you control in the entity so control really is defined to mean your ability to appoint majority directors on the board of the company and to control policy decision management decisions etc by virtue of your shareholding voting rights uh, voting agreements etc there's a similar definition in the foreign direct investment policy and the companies act as well uh, and you see now there have been decisions and uh, legal uh, debates around what would constitute control and what ideally is expected to the to be the position is that it's not something that is proactive it, it's it's more proactive and not something reactive so if you're having more of protective rights, ideally you should not be construed to be in control, but one needs to examine this on a case-to-case -case basis. The test really is to see if you are in the driving seat and if the answer to the question is yes, then the, you could be said to be in control. It's really to see that you have a positive power and not a negative power. So the principles I've just mentioned were actually laid down in the case of Shubkam Ventures uh, which was a sat order this thereafter was appealed by sebi in supreme court but due to certain circumstances uh, this was withdrawn and was not contested or decided by the supreme court at that point in time the supreme court also mentioned in its order that presidential value should not be ascribed to shubkam's case this question once again came up in the case of arcelor mittal uh, though it was in the context of an IBC, which was a bankruptcy code uh, transaction, the question really was whether a particular entity was e related to the bidder. And all the sort of uh, specific principles that were laid down in the case of Shubkam Ventures were considered 
and were sort of you know observed and reaffirmed by the supreme court to that extent so one can certainly say that the court did take notice of these uh, conditions and uh, shubkam was once again even though it was a tribunal judgment uh, shubkam was once again re reproduced and relied upon for actually taking the decision in this uh, arsalan mittal supreme court case we've now listed down a few uh, sort of rights which could not which would not amount to control and these have been done based on our experience in recent cases but i want to just uh, add a disclaimer to this that it's not really something that is watertight or prescribed because it was attempted by sebi by, while they introduced the bright line test paper but it never saw the light of the day so it, every transaction is analyzed and we receive comments from the securities exchange board of india generally when uh, issues of this nature are involved but uh, you know rights which are more in the nature of protective rights for example having an observer on the board of uh, having a say in case of any alteration to capital structure by back capital reduction having a say for change in auditors payment of dividends any indebted incurring of any debts etc these kind of transactions was having any rights in relation to these could be construed more as protective rights but it has to be evaluated on a case to case basis i've already mentioned a lot uh, about global transaction and i want to share an example which we dealt with uh, in our experience so in the case of axelia kale while it was a global transaction and we were all at uh, ease that it would be having a more detailed uh, you know sort of a more relaxed timeline after the initial announcement uh, after all financials were analyzed it was it was noted that because it was crossing the 80% threshold of the nav sales revenue market capitalization it was actually deemed to be a direct offer and therefore all the timelines were applicable as if it was a direct acquisition so the so the advantage that you have in a global transaction is that why after the initial announcement you can wait until the primary transaction concludes there could be two situations thereafter your primary transaction never concludes in which case you don't make the detailed announcement or your primary transaction concludes you make the detailed announcement and you pay interest at 10% per annum from the date you would have usually made the detailed public announcement and the day when you actually make it there could be also transactions which would involve a merger uh, and if it is a merger overseas which is court approved this could be an exempted transaction but uh, our ex uh, the in regulations the sebi takeover regulations contemplate only court approved mergers and not uh, not contractual mergers which are uh, which are possible in certain jurisdictions so that really brings me to the end of uh, the topics we wanted to highlight from a sebi takeover regulations perspective you can keep the questions coming as we proceed to a few issues we thought were very very interesting from a foreign investment uh, law perspective uh, in public transactions the first issue really is that you see the 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 fdi policy read with the new recent non debt instrument central government rules defines foreign direct investment to mean any investment above 10% threshold in a listed company what happens if someone's investing below 10% there is a separate definition in the rules which defines foreign portfolio investment now the problem that we've seen that's been occurring is that in such situations a few market participants are taking a position that if you are making a foreign direct investment below 10% then you can only do it through a foreign portfolio investor registered with sebi which is an altogether a separate route of investment so we've had a discussion on this issue with the reserve bank of india and a couple of authorized dealers as well and the position that reserve bank has been very categorical and clear about is that whether you are acquiring less than 10% or more than 10% so long as your intention is to acquire a uh, shareholding under the fdi route 
you don't necessarily need to do it by setting up a foreign portfolio investment vehicle only fact is that it will be treated as a investment which is not subject to as many disclosures as are prescribed in a usual foreign direct investment transaction which is about 10 percent but the only issue is that because there is no separate disclosure prescribed the market uh, we've seen market participants still making the normal reporting as if it was a more than 10 percent investment but I just want to clarify that there is no intention the regulator had in our basis, our experience and discussion that only about 10% will be FDI. So even below 10% could be done through a non-resident investor who's not an SP, not registered as a SEBI portfolio investor. But uh, this, uh, the reporting will have to be discussed with the relevant authorized dealer. Uh, so that's doable clearly. The next uh, interesting issue that we've dealt with is when are the situations where a non-resident shareholder can acquire shares on the floor of the stock exchange? We all know that one uh, sort of mode is if you are a foreign portfolio investor registered with SEBI. The second situation is if you have acquired control and happen to continue to have control in the listed entity, you could as a non-resident investor acquire uh, shares on the floor of the stock exchange and we've dealt with a recent uh, uh, case where there was a global transaction which was involving change of hands between two groups foreign promoter groups and it was actually a change of hand between a hold co and a subsidiary these would constitute as deemed persons acting in concert and hence could be treated to be having joint control uh, also, the specific situation in our case was that in any event, the subsidiary did have some voting agreement along with the Holco who actually held the shares. So this transfer, even though the shareholder who's acquiring the shares was not named as a promoter because did not hold any shares, uh, the position that being explored is that it could still argue that it is in control by virtue of the relationship with the other shareholder who's the existing shareholder and could con could acquire shares on the floor of the stock exchange another issue i wanted to highlight which is also quite uh, uh, which does potentially create a possible difficulty in transactions involving uh, listed companies and foreign investors is that there is a certain set of pricing guidelines that has been prescribed these pricing guidelines have been linked to the averages of a few weeks before the actual transaction being undertaken so the issue really is around the concept of relevant date so all these formulas can be applied only from the relevant date which is defined to mean the day when you actually do the transfer of shares now in cases which trigger an open offer there's clearly a gap of around 60 to 70 days between the signing of the agreement with the price calculated and the actual transaction being undertaken there could be potentially a fluctuation in the prices and thereafter there could be a scenario where on the date of closing you are actually looking at a price which is different from the price that you have agreed upon in your definitive agreement therefore what the recommendation is that one needs to approach the reserve bank of india upfront and get an approval to deal with a possible potential scenario like this because otherwise it could lead to a difficult commercial situation where you have a fixed cost that is in the mind of the acquirer there's a binding agreement to that effect but because of delays or steps or processes that you were required mandatorily to follow you will be in a situation that you cannot undertake the transaction at the agreed price that uh, sort of brings an end to even the concept uh, or the issues that we wanted to highlight from the foreign investment law perspective so really i've tried to quickly summarize a few takeaways for from our session today one is that there are certain restrictions that one needs to be mindful of when dealing with information of listed company particularly material information and one needs to be careful that sharing of such information has been done with the due process of law to avoid any potential uh, 
non-compliance or you know any inadvertent non-compliance of the SEBI insider trading regulations applicable. If you want to share information for the due diligence, you need to have appropriate confidentiality agreements, non-disclosure arrangements in place and board approvals, etc. Your protective rights that you get in a or that you are potentially looking at getting in a listed company, whether they are for actually taking control or merely to protect your financial investments need to be very carefully analyzed and understood. Global transactions, one needs to very carefully evaluate any Indian connection of Indian listed companies because we've seen more than at least three cases in the recent past where there have been last minute announcements, issues were not considered and potentially one case where there has even been a delay. And let me clarify that a delay is not a happy situation for a new investor making an acquisition overseas because as soon as you started your transaction, you will first have a settlement with the securities regulator. And the last one is that you are allowed to acquire shares on the market even if you are not a foreign portfolio investor, but if you are in control or you are in joint control and uh, uh, you need to be mindful of the possible price fluctuations in cases involving an open offer because there is a certain time lag involved. Uh, that's really all for the session. I'm happy to take questions. Also, you can see my contact details there uh, where uh, you can email me questions as well if there are any afterthoughts. Plus, we will try to answer most of them. But uh, if we can't, then we will email our responses to you. So I'll read out the first question really. Whether the right to appoint a managerial personnel would constitute as control under the takeover regulations. So as I mentioned to you, you see the it is something that is required to be analyzed on a case to case basis. We will need to evaluate what are the rights that personnel will have, what is the position, whether it is a key managerial personnel, whether there are there are certain rights that are being given which are unusual for an employee to have. But if such right to appointment is purely with the intent or if such right is purely to protect your investment and does not give any sort of proactive ability to drive the company's functioning or management and policy decisions, then in such case it would not amount to control. Next question we have is, how does one handle a situation and respond to stock exchanges and SEBI when information of a potential transaction is leaked? Yes, this is, uh, thank you for this, it's a very interesting question. Uh, we have seen many situations where you have a press article right before a potential announcement or a signing of a documentation and uh, you get queries from stock exchanges asking you whether there are any such uh, transactions in the process or whether there are uh, what is really this all about you know sometimes i've seen there is it, it as i mentioned in during our session that you know such information sharing whether it is from an official otherwise or through other sources does not amount to making it generally available to the public and therefore company has to only respond stating the actual position there could be an answer to say that whatever may be the factual position but the answer could potentially be that you see there are there are discussions in place but there is no decision taken and whatever appropriate disclosures are required we shall make those appropriate disclosures uh, to the stock exchanges uh, as per the requirements of the regulations so but there is no other requirement per se for you because if there is some decision underway uh, you can clearly mention that you would comply with the requirement as and when this arises. This is particularly because there are timelines prescribed within which you will have to share the information with the stock exchanges once decision has been taken. The next question is would signing of a term sheet trigger the requirement for making a mandatory open offer? Now 
as we discussed during our session any acquisition includes the term acquisition includes agreement to acquire there could be different forms of term sheets which could be binding or non binding form of term sheets uh, ideally any such documentation would display or would clearly indicate the intention of the parties to implement a potential transaction hence i would recommend and this is my view that one should avoid any such documentation being signed uh, before which 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 does sort of you know uh, detail a potential proposed transaction unless you are ready and you have agreed and discussed and reached a commercial conclusion because uh, while the regulations do prescribe the possibility of a withdrawal it's a process which is a very difficult process so there could be in cases of a direct acquisition there could be a very very difficult scenario where you would uh, not be able to then withdraw you would then be able have to explain that there was just a non binding arrangement you had not agreed there was no trigger because i have seen situations where even subsequent transactions which don't go through sebi that is the securities exchange board of india would still insist that uh, we continue and complete the open offer because you have given the ex opportunity and exit offer to the public already next question i have already i think dealt with uh, largely but uh, i will repeat that what are the precautions one should take in case of a global transaction my recommendations would be that one should see that uh, you know that there is if there is an indian connection it's a good idea to evaluate what is the indian connection what is the holding in the list and, and if it's a connection obviously with an indian, indian listed company what is the holding whether the whole entity that is holding shares is categorized as a part of a promoter promoter group and uh, understand in advance what is the timeline that you will be looking at whether it will be an indirect offer you will have the time to de defer your detailed statement whether it will be deemed direct offer assuming that the indian investment is a substantial part of the uh, hold co and uh, also be aware and prepared of the possible requirements and disclosures that one needs to be mindful of uh, once an offer is triggered uh, and you know once an offer is initiated any more questions thank you there's a question where uh, someone wants to know that what are the regulations in which there is a requirement prescribed for sharing of information during a due diligence so the sebi insider trading regulations of 2015 prescribe and lay down the process of how one will share information of a public listed company in case of a due diligence as part of a potential transaction and i have already discussed the process there could be a triggered transaction or a transaction not involving a trigger both of them would require a board approval and in cases where you don't have a trigger before the execution of the agreement for the transaction one would need to have a uh, one would need to have the information that is the unpublished price sensitive information available in the public domain as and also two work two trading days should have elapsed from the date of such sharing of the information the next question is that post recent fema 
non debt instrument rules of 2019 whether less than 10% foreign investment requires FPI registration. I did clarify and I am happy to clarify again that the position the regulator has always had though it has led to a confusion and this is our understanding given our discussion and work we have done with them is that even below 10% could be foreign direct investment but uh, and you do not necessarily need to obtain a foreign portfolio investment registration investor registration you however I would recommend however that you discuss this with your relevant bank authorized dealer bank through whom which you will who's through whom the transaction is being implemented and do make a reporting because today there is no clarity on what reporting you would do for transactions below 10 percent. I have another question but I am not very clear with it I would request you to clarify. Could you please please explain again when in when in position of insider info how the approval is obtained and how long it usually takes. I assume this question relates to the fact that how does one trade when that person is in possession of unpublished price sensitive information. Uh, if you are a potential acquirer then you can trade only after the information has become generally available to the public for two trading days. If you are a person in the company in control of the company and are looking at trading uh, you will have to be mindful of the code of conduct and any window closure periods that are applicable to you and you will have to obtain a pre approval from your compliance officer it could usually be given to you in a day or two depending on the situation involved and will be valid for 7 days from the date you have received it. There is another question I think just a second. A very interesting question and I am happy to clarify this again is the view that requirement to make public key DD findings. So, the what we discussed that you know due diligence findings in a listed company is it a requirement to make this available two trading days prior to closing or prior to signing. Uh, the definition of trading includes an agreement to subscribe plus acquisition under takeover code includes an agreement to acquire and therefore, any agreement per se would not be possible unless in our view obviously, unless this information and these findings have been made available for two trading day period. So, I think that is uh, all the questions that we had for today. Uh, thank you very much once again everyone for uh, participating in this webinar and I hope you had uh, you did uh, benefit from the information we provided. I will be happy to take further questions as well. You can see my uh, contact details on your screens and you can share uh, your questions over email to me and we will be happy to respond to them as well. Thank you very much once again everyone. Uh, thank you.